And then Jesus had said that the hour had come uh, for him to be glorified. And the glorifying he was talking about was himself um, dying and rising again. Um, and then God's voice had come from heaven and said, you know, uh, yes, I will glorify my name and I'll glorify it again. Uh, and the people all heard God's voice coming from heaven. Some people said it was like thunder, remember? And other people said it's an angel that was talking. And really neither was true. It was God the Father speaking his word out to his people. Okay, now I want, we, we read this little bit already, but I want us, oh no, this is, let me look here. Yes, um, yes, this is what we want to read. Let's start with verse uh, 30. Let's double checking here. Yeah, verse 30 down to verse 36. So this voice from heaven has just come. And now the people have said it was an angel or it was thunder. And now Jesus uh, speaks about this voice that has come. So let's let's read 30 down to 36. Jesus said, the voice was for your benefit. Now is the time for judgment among this world. So I will answer this question. Will be driven out of the eye. And I am lifted up with all men to my son. He said the soul and the death he was going to die. The crowd spoke up. We have heard from the law that the Christ will remain forever. So how can you say the son of man must be lifted up? Who is this son of man? Then Jesus told him. You are going to have the light just a little while on the clock while you let your light before dark darkness overtakes you. The man who walks in the dark does not know where he is going. Put your trust in the light while you have it so that you may be sons of light. When you have finished speaking, Jesus left and gave himself found them. Okay, thank you, Alan. So, that, like I said, this voice is just spoken from heaven and said, uh, that God, God has said, yeah, I'm going to glorify my name. I have glorified it. I'll glorify it again. Jesus says, this voice didn't come for my sake, but for your sake, so that you would believe that I came from God. So God, the Father speaking to reassure us that Jesus has in fact come from God. Um, and then he starts talking about what's going to happen to him. He says in verse 32, well, in, or in verse 31, now is the judgment of this world now is the prince of this world. Now will the prince of this world will be driven out. But I, when I'm lifted up to the earth, will draw all men to myself. Now, this is interesting in verse 31. Jesus is talking about the judgment of the world. And when does he say it's going to happen? Right now. He's saying right now. Now is the time for the judgment of this world. Now, when we think of the world being judged, when do we think of that happening? the end times when jesus comes again and that's true we're not denying that here okay that's true we from thence he will come to judge the living and the dead like we say it in the apostles creed right but we need to realize here that while that's true that jesus is going to come again and judge the living and the dead the judgment of this world has already happened at the same time and it already happened when jesus died on the cross the judgment of the world, which was guilty, was put on him, right? Now is the judgment of this world, and I'm going to take this whole judgment on myself. And when I do that, it says here, um, the prince of this world will be driven out. The prince of this world is the devil, okay? So when Jesus takes the judgment of the world, the guilty verdict of the world upon himself, He's going to drive out the devil because the devil's the devil's weapon is the fact that we're all guilty. This is the this is the card that he had in his back pocket, his trump card all the time. They're guilty. They're guilty. They're guilty. And he could waltz in there before God and say, look at all these sinful people. They're not yours. They're mine. Right. But then Jesus comes, takes the judgment of the world upon himself, which is guilty, takes it all upon himself. And as a result, the prince of this world, the devil's cast out. He's got nothing left. His trump card is taken away. His greatest weapon is stolen because Jesus has taken the judgment of the world upon himself. So when Jesus comes again to judge on the last day, you and me who have this faith in Jesus, we already know what the verdict is. Not guilty. 
because he's already taken the guilty verdict for us, right? We were guilty. He took the punishment, everything that went along with that away for us already. And so now the verdict for us is not guilty. And when he comes again, that's what we know he's going to say, right? So that last, the judgment on the last day is not something for you and me to be afraid of because we already know what it is. Make sense? Yes, the beautiful thing. Yeah, Alan? Why the Bible says after Jesus died, we are in the last days. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. We've been living in the last days for 2,000 years. Yeah, absolutely. And it's also why the Bible says things like there is now, and this is in Romans chapter 8, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Like condemnation means judgment and being declared guilty. And for us who are in Jesus, in Christ Jesus, who have this faith in Jesus, who have been baptized into him, there's no more guilty verdict for us because we're in Jesus and he's taken the guilty verdict already, right? So there's no condemnation for us who are, who are in Christ Jesus. Um, the judgment of the world has come. Jesus has been judged in our place. The devil has been cast out as a result, okay? Um, and he, and he, he spells this all out here, including verse 32, when he says, but when I'm lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to myself. He doesn't mean his ascension into heaven. When Jesus is talking about being lifted up from the earth, he means being lifted up on the cross. We know that because earlier in the gospel of John, in chapter three, when Jesus was talking to the guy Nicodemus, remember he had a conversation with Nicodemus, one of these Pharisee guys who had come to him at nighttime. Um, in John chapter three, Jesus talked about just like when Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Remember that story? The snakes were biting the people of Israel and they prayed to God to take away the snakes and God didn't take away the snakes. Instead, he told Moses to make a snake out of bronze, put it on a stick, and whenever the people looked at it, they would be, they would be healed, right? And so Jesus said, just like in John chapter three, Jesus said, just like Moses put the stick up or the, the snake up on the pole so that people could look at it and be saved. So the son of man, me, Jesus is saying, must be lifted up so that whoever believes in me can have eternal life. So when Jesus talks about being lifted up, he doesn't mean lifted up into heaven. He means being lifted up on the cross, right? And the crowds that are there, they understand that completely. Look at verse 34. Um, they say, we have heard from the law that the Christ will remain forever. So how can you say the son of man must be lifted up? So their, their understanding from the Old Testament is that the Christ, the Messiah, whenever he comes, is going to be around forever. Now, they've just heard Jesus talk about the son of man, the, the Messiah, being lifted up. And right away, they know what that means, right? They, they, crucifixions were common things in those days, right? So they know, oh, he's talking about getting lifted up on a cross or something like that. And they say, how can that be? The Messiah is supposed to be here forever. And you're saying the Messiah is going to die on a cross. And they say, that doesn't line up for us, right? Now, what they're missing is that, yes, the Christ, the Messiah does remain forever, but he remains forever because he dies on that cross and then rises from the dead. And that's the piece of the puzzle that's not quite there yet, right? But they're, they're confused. They're confused about all this. But that's the interesting thing, is the crowds who are there, they know exactly what Jesus is talking about. When he says, I'm going to be lifted up, they're, they're, they, their ears hear, you're, you're saying you're going to be crucified. I don't, I don't know this for sure, but I kind of wonder if being lifted up was kind of how people back then talked about crucifying, right? Because it's a pretty nasty thing. It was a pretty common thing, but it was a pretty nasty thing. And it was one of those things you probably didn't want to say out loud crucifying or something like that so maybe they talked about lifted up was kind of a, what we call it a euphemism right a nice way of saying crucified because you just don't want to say that word because it's a really nasty thing to have happen to somebody yeah well that's what we do the same thing we don't we we, we, we shy away from that word like death like so and so didn't die they passed away right because it sounds nicer right but the truth is we all know what it means they died right? We just don't always like to say it, right? And so it's kind of like that here. I wonder if it's kind of like that here, where lifted up is a nicer way of saying he got crucified, right? Because that's a pretty nasty thing, and they don't, no one wants to mention it. What was there? It's, uh, on the cross, 
A normal person dying on a cross would usually be there for a few days. Yeah, it was slow and painful, and that's how they wanted it. The Ro that's how the Romans wanted it. That's what. That's what's like when when Jesus dies on the cross. Um, then the guy named Joseph of Arimathea goes to Pontius Pilate and asks to have Jesus's body, and Pilate is surprised that he's dead already because it's only been about six hours, and. He says why he sends the soldiers to go like, yeah, go make sure he's dead, please, right? And they pierce his side with the spear, right? Um, the other two guys who are crucified beside Jesus, the two thieves on either side, they're not dead at that point. They're still alive, but they come along and they break those guys' legs because it will make them die faster. Because they're gruesome details, but when you were up on the cross, what killed you eventually was you would suffocate because the weight of your own body would crush down on your lungs and you couldn't breathe. So how you stayed alive on a cross, just instinctively, what you would naturally do is your feet were down here nailed on and you push yourself up with your legs so that your lungs are open and then you can breathe and then you go back down again and you're suffocating and it's like this for hours. But once they break their legs, they can't push up anymore and they'll die within a minutes or hour maximum, right? It was really nasty it, and it was, not in the, the Romans were cruel and nasty, and that's why they did it this way, right? So it, it's remarkable on the one hand that Jesus dies so quickly. Um, but we know why that is. It's because he's not just suffering the physical pain of the cross, he's taking the entire punishment of hell at the same time, right? right. And human bodies aren't meant to deal with that, right? And so he, it's all being put on him all at the same time. And when it's finished, he's finished, and he gives up his spirit, and he dies, right? And it's a, rel a much shorter time than the average span of time that a person would spend on a cross. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, and yeah, it, it was a, yeah, it was a really cruel thing. But you just look through history, and people have been cruel. Ever since the fall into sin. No, exactly. Exactly. It's not. That's, and that, that's my point, right? You go back to Adam and Eve's sin, and the very next story you have in the Bible, essentially, is Cain murdering Abel, right? This, this is what sin brought into the world. And ever since then, you just have a legacy of human beings being cruel to each other and cruel to the planet and cruel to animals and cruel. It's just, that's, that's the nature of the world. That's the world that Jesus came into to save us from. And he just went, he took all the cruelty that the world had to offer into himself, took all the judgment and the punishment that that cruelty deserved into himself so that we could be saved from it. And that's exactly what, what, we, what, what, what he's doing for us here. Um, and look at, what, look at what Jesus says here about what's going to happen, or what does he say is going to happen when he's lifted up? He's talking about when he's on the cross. When I'm lifted up from the earth, what does he say I'm go he's going to do? I will draw all people to myself, right? So Jesus lifted up on the cross is drawing all people to himself. And I thought this quotation here that I've got um, here um, just kind of summarizes that beautifully. This is from, again, from this guy, Athanasius. He's the, the long, the long creed is named after him. Uh, he says, it is only on the cross that a man dies with his hands spread out. Now that might be a bit of an exaggeration. There's probably other ways that people die with their arms spread out, but he's making a point here, okay? He says, and so it was fitting for the Lord to bear this also and to spread out his hands that with one, he might draw the ancient people and with the other, those from the Gentiles and unite both in himself, right? So he's saying we have to, he's giving us another reason why this was a fitting way for Jesus to die with his arms stretched out like this, because he's literally gathering all the people to himself there on the cross, the ancient people, the Jewish people of the Old Testament, but also everybody, the whole world, I'll draw the world, all people to myself. And that's what's happening there on the cross with Jesus's arms outstretched. He's, he's gathering them all in, and that includes us. Thanks be to God. Yeah, Alan? <laughs> Yep. Yeah, like a like a he, Jesus talks about 
in Matthew and in Luke about like a hen gathering her chicks under her wings, right? And we can imagine that's what Jesus is doing there, gathering us under his wings. Uh, and the hen does that. That's one of my favorite little sayings of Jesus. Um, as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings to protect them from some danger, right? Let's say a fox or something like that. She's going to allow the fox to attack her to save her young, right? And that's what Jesus is doing, stretching out his arms over us, allowing himself to be attacked and killed so that we, living under the shadow of his wings, which is how the Old Testament likes to put it, right, can sing for joy because we're saved from that fox out there that wanted to gobble us all up, right? So beautiful stuff as Jesus is talking about all of this here. Um, the crowds, like I said, though, they don't get it. They think the Messiah, the Christ, is supposed to re remain forever. So how can you say that the Son of Man must be lifted up? And then look at this at the end of verse 34. They say, who is this Son of Man? They don't even really get that it's Jesus, right? They think you must be talking about someone else. You're not, you, you can't be the one who's doing that. You can't be the Messiah, the Savior. Um, they're, they're, they're missing all of that. So they, but they asked Jesus in verse 34, who is this son of man? And then notice in verse 35 and 36, Jesus does his frustrating Jesus thing where he doesn't answer their question, right? They asked him, who is this son of man? And Jesus doesn't say, it's me, you dummies, figure it out. You know, no, he doesn't say that. All he says is you are going to have the light just a little while longer. And he's told them before, he said things like this before. He said, I'm the light of the world. You, whoever walks with me walks it in the light and all of this kind of stuff so he says that again here you have uh, you, you are going to have the light just a little while longer walk while you have the light lest darkness overtakes you the man who walks in the dark doesn't know where he's going put your trust in the light while you have it so that you may become sons of light and then it says um and, and so he gives them kind of this cryptic answer but means while I'm still here, you need to be listening to my words, which they're not doing, okay? Uh, and then it says, when he had finished speaking, Jesus left and hid himself. Now, this is the second time we've had this. At the end of chapter 11, uh, Jesus went away and hid himself, okay? Now he's come back into public again, and now he's going away and hiding himself, right? Um, because it's not quite time yet for him to die on the cross. So we're still on Palm Sunday, right? And it's, it, he's reached a point now where he's told them what everything he's planned to tell them. He's going to say one more thing here in just a minute. But he's like, look, I've told you what you need to know. If you're not going to believe it, you're not going to believe it. Right? But this is, I've given you everything I came to give you. Now all that's left is for me to go die and rise again. But it's not quite time yet. So he goes and hides himself away. Okay? Um, any other thoughts or questions about that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they could, they're not wrong, right? And that, that's the point. So Kathleen was reading from Isaiah chapter nine there, which is that famous part of the Bible, what we hear at Christmas time for to us, a child is born to us, a son is given the government will be upon his shoulders name will be called wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. And it goes on to say that he's going to reign on the throne and he'll reign forever. That's what the Old Testament says about the Savior, about the Messiah, about the Christ. He's going to come and he's going to reign forever. So the people here aren't wrong to say, wait a second, the Messiah is supposed to reign forever. How can you say the Messiah has to be lifted up on a cross and die? But it's like I was saying, what they're missing is the fact that, yes, he's got to die, right, and then rise again. And that's, that's the key piece of the puzzle that everybody's missing. Right. Jesus has told them this, but I guess it was just hard to believe when somebody says, I'm going to go die and rise again. They say, oh, well, that's crazy talk. Right. Um, but he actually means it. Right. And 
we can say thanks be to God that we live on the other side of Pentecost and have the Holy Spirit teaching us to understand these things, because otherwise we'd be in the same boat as them, right? Going back to verse 32, um, I will draw all men to myself, that I think that really gives us some urgency to show love to those who don't believe, because yep. it's not just... It's not just the believers, it's it's the unbelievers too. He yeah. draws all people to himself, right? Yeah. And so when you think of a verse like how great the joy in heaven over one sinner who repents, mm -hmm. well, the flip side of that is the grief of those who don't repent yeah. and stray yeah. from, from Christ. And yeah, and we'll get and to that in more than some intimate these connections with each one of us, yeah. including you. Yeah, and we'll see that in a little bit here when we get to a little bit more stuff about Judas, although that's over in chapter 13, so we might not make it there today. But yeah, good point. Any other thoughts or questions or anything? Okay, then let's read a little bit further. Uh, verse 37 down to verse 43. Even Okay, so first thing we have here, we have to realize here, this is, this is John, the writer of the gospel, giving us a little bit of um, explanation of what's going on here, right? So he says in verse, this is, so this is John speaking, telling us even after Jesus had done all these miraculous signs, remember there's been seven of them now, right? Everything from turning water into wine at the wedding at Cana to raising Lazarus from the dead. Seven signs, and seven's an important biblical number because there's seven days of creation. That's the completeness, the fullness. Jesus has given them a complete and full set of miracles, more than enough for them to believe, okay? So even though Jesus had done all these miraculous signs in their presence, they still would not believe in him. We know that some people did, of course, but we're talking about these religious leaders who are rejecting Jesus, okay? This, John tells us, was to fulfill the word of the Isaiah the prophet. And actually, he gives us two quotations here from Isaiah the prophet. The first one is uh, from Isaiah chapter 53, where it says, Lord, who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? So that's the first quote from Isaiah, which is a, a, a verse that's talking about yeah, lots of people haven't believed. The arm of the Lord has been revealed. Jesus is the arm of the Lord, right? And God, you can imagine, God has rolled up his sleeve and reached down into the into human history to save his people. And, and yet people, the people who he's trying to save haven't believed in him. So he, Isaiah's, Isaiah's talking about that. And then a couple of verses down, we've got another quote from Isaiah this time from Isaiah chapter six. And here it says that God, God is the he here in verse 40. He has blinded their hearts, eyes. God has blinded their eyes and God has deadened their hearts so that they can neither see with their eyes nor understand with their hearts nor turn and I would heal them. So now this is a tricky little thing, okay? God is saying here, look, I've done this to them so they can't believe. And John tells us that, look back at verse 39. For this reason, they could not believe, because as Isaiah says, and then he gives us this quotation, where it's talking about how God has made their eyes blind, not literally, but spiritually blind. He's made their hearts dead, or their hearts hard, right, so that they can't believe, and, and, and God has done this, right, and that sounds weird to us, okay? So, what are we, we going to do with this? It, they 
They, they couldn't believe. That's what John is telling us here. So St. Augustine kind of has to wrestle with this a little bit. And he says, but some, some people mutter and ask, what fault of it was uh, of it? Uh, what fault was it of the Jews if it was necessary that the sayings of Isaiah should be fulfilled? So he said, "Look, Isaiah said this. So if Isaiah said that they couldn't believe, then how can we blame them for not believing, right? Okay. But then he says, we answer that God, foreseeing the future, predicted by the prophet or through the prophet the unbelief of the Jews, but did not cause it." God does not compel people to sin, okay? So what he's saying here is that, yes, Isaiah said way back in the Old Testament, 700 years before Jesus was even born, that these people wouldn't believe. And he even said that, yes, God would blind their eyes and harden their hearts. But God didn't cause them not to believe, not initially, okay? God looked into the future because God sees the future and knows everything, knew that those people wouldn't believe and therefore hardened their hearts, blinded their eyes. Okay. It's complicated, but the best, the, the best way to understand it, I think is to, is to think of another Bible story. And that's the story of, of Pharaoh when the people of Israel are slaves in Egypt. Okay. Remember the people of Israel are slaves in Egypt and Moses is going to Pharaoh saying, let God's people go. And what does Pharaoh say? No. And initially, he's saying that entirely of his own volition, right? He's hardening his own heart and saying, no, I won't let those people go. And that happens four or five times. I can't remember exactly how many. And then God says to Moses, okay, go talk to Pharaoh again. But just so you know, now I have hardened his heart. He hardened his heart, I don't know, four or five times. And then God says, okay, he did that to himself. Now I've really hardened his heart i've done it because he already did it right so he sends moses and says look i know what he's what he's going to say we know what he's going to say he's going to say no but go anyways right because god's got a plan in all of this and pharaoh's hard heart doesn't stop god's plan in fact pharaoh's hard heart is part of god's plan because god needs pharaoh to say no until that Passover thing happens. Because that's the thing that's going to show us a picture of Jesus. So he hardens Pharaoh's heart. Well, Pharaoh hardens his own heart. And then God makes sure that Pharaoh's heart is hard until the Passover happens. So that those lambs can be sacrificed and their blood can be put around the doors so that we can understand what this is telling us about Jesus, who's our Passover lamb, who takes away the sin of the world. Right. So God had a plan in all of this and his plan included Pharaoh's hard heart. And so he had to harden Pharaoh's heart to make sure it happened. OK, make sense. Same thing here. These religious leaders of the people of Israel, they hardened their own hearts, didn't believe in Jesus. But God needed their hearts to stay hard and continue to reject Jesus. So that they would crucify Jesus. And so that's what he did. He hardened their hearts to such a point that they would crucify Jesus because it's through that that God is accomplishing the salvation of the world. Okay? That makes sense? Kind of. It's God's ways, not our ways. So it's higher than us. But yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they hardened their own heart. And at a certain point, and in a certain, they hardened their own heart. And then at a certain point, God himself hardened their hearts additionally to ensure that they would do what he needed them to do. Their heart, again, just like with Pharaoh, their hard hearts were part of God's plan. Not because he wanted them to do that, but because they were, he knew they were already going to do that themselves. So he hardened their hearts to make sure that this all would play out the way he needed it to play out, right? It's possible, but we wouldn't ever know, right? I would never... 
like we we don't have a word from God that says I've hardened that person's heart. Don't bother, right? Um, it's possible. It's possible. What's that? The, yeah, a Calvinist or someone like that, a Reformed person might say that, but um, we don't know that. So we would always assume that there's still a possibility that they could be brought back. But it's, it is possible if you. And there's a danger. That's the danger of hardening your own heart. Is like look, you 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 can get yourself so far down that path that that yeah you've put yourself outside of what god is trying to do but at the same time i would never we'd never assume that right yeah yeah yeah, and I, th I think as long as we're here living in this life, we have to assume that the Holy Spirit's still working in the lives of everyone, because we just don't know, right? It's that's We don't have a clear word from God saying, that person's heart, I've hardened it, don't bother with them anymore. No, we, we don't know that. So we, we keep reaching out to everybody with that same hope, right? But it does warn us here that, look, if you're going to want to go down that path of hardening your heart, there's there's a danger to that, a serious, 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 serious danger to that. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yep. Yep. No, we, yeah, that's not given to us to judge. We're given to, to, to show the love of Jesus to everybody. And let Jesus sort them out on the last day. That's his that's his prerogative, not mine. Right? He desires all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Yeah. Okay. Um, so one more thing about this here in this hardening of their hearts bit that I think um, kind of can help us to understand this. So uh, it says in verse 41, it says, Isaiah said this. Right, we had these two quotes from Isaiah. Okay, so it says Isaiah said this because he saw Jesus's glory and spoke about him. Okay, so this is the question: What did Isaiah see that made him say these words? We have these two quotations from Isaiah. What did Isaiah see that caused him to see these words? And all we know here is it says he saw Jesus's glory. Okay, now with a, just a little bit of digging we got two very interesting possibilities, okay? So the first one of these quotations here in verse 40 comes from Isaiah chapter 6. I sh should say, sorry, the second one of these quotations comes from Isaiah chapter 6, okay? And Isaiah chapter 6 is an absolutely wonderful chapter of the book of Isaiah where Isaiah has a vision and he sees God in the temple, okay? And some of this will sound familiar. Let me read this for you. So he's, Isaiah says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, kind of angels. Each had six win, wings, with two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. That's the song we sing before communion. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, heaven and earth are full of your glory. We just steal it from the angels in the Old Testament, okay? Then, he says, the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke, and I said, woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar, and he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. Right? So Isaiah has this vision, seeing God in the temple, and we could say, okay, Isaiah saw Jesus' glory right there in the temple. He saw it, right? And and, and he was afraid because of his sinfulness, but this angel came and put a burning coal from the altar on his lips to, to assure him that his sins were forgiven, okay? That's one option when it says Isaiah saw Jesus's glory, therefore he wrote these things, okay? However, the other quote that we have from Isaiah here, this one, the one in verse 38, the first one comes from Isaiah chapter 53. Now, Isaiah chapter 53 is like, 
the, the Good Friday chapter of Isaiah. In fact, we read it every year on Good Friday, okay? And this is just a little snippet from there. Isaiah says, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And by his wounds, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. That's Good Friday, right? That's, that's all of it right there. He's bearing our griefs, taking our sorrows. His, him being pierced was for our sins, crushed for our iniquities, all that kind of stuff. Now, Isaiah is telling you about this because he's seen this too, right? God has shown Isaiah this. 700 years before Jesus is born, God has shown Isaiah Jesus dying on the cross. And so that's why I think it says in verse 41, Isaiah said this because he saw Jesus's glory, because this is Jesus's glory on the cross. And Isaiah said that or saw that and therefore he said, yes, the Lord has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts so that they don't repent and don't stop what they're doing because they need to crucify Jesus. Because it's through crucifying Jesus that all this stuff that we're talking about here is going to happen. He needs to be crucified so that he can take our transgressions, our sins and iniquities, and that he can bring us peace. Right? He has to die on the cross. So Isaiah has seen this and said, this is why God hardened their hearts, so that they would crucify him, so that the salvation of the world could happen. Make sense? Yeah, that's the that's his glory right there. That's the height of his glory. Yeah, that's the whole. That, that is the point, right? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So God hardened their hearts because Jesus needed to be crucified. It was a necessity. Thoughts, questions about any of that? No, they didn't. They didn't catch that part, and neither did Jesus' own disciples. That's why when he dies, they all think all is lost. Yeah, they, and they go away sad. Yeah. So yeah, some of the some of the ladies, some of the ladies understand. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Any other thoughts or questions about any of that? Yeah. 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 That's that's where it the, the kingdom of God works differently than we think it should work. We expect the kingdom of God to be great and glorious and everything will be wonderful all the time. And it will be when Jesus comes again. But in the kingdom of God, suffering always comes before glory. And that's the picture Jesus gives us. Suffering first, then glory. Now we're in the suffering part. It's not always a lot of fun, right? But we're enduring the suffering part, knowing that we're joined with Jesus in his suffering and that we're looking forward to the eternal weight of glory that he's prepared for those who trust in him. Yeah. Okay. Um, then now we're into verse 42 here, 42 and 43. So the the... Uh, the people's hearts have been hardened, their eyes have been blinded, so they can't believe. But John tells us at, at the same time, many of them did believe, even among the leaders. We know about that from that guy, Nicodemus. Remember, he believed in Jesus, but he came at nighttime because he was afraid, right? Then we know late, later in the Gospel of John, we're going to learn about a guy named Joseph of Arimathea. He's one of the ones who's going to look after burying Jesus. He's one of the leaders of the people of Israel. He believes in Jesus. And presumably there's others too that we don't know about. But these guys believe in Jesus. But what are they unwilling to do? They believe in their heart, but they're unwilling to do what? Yeah, go public. They're unwilling, it says here, to confess their faith. Why? Yeah, well, yeah because, because they have this fear. Right there, and specifically, they're afraid of being put out of the synagogue. And remember, we've had we've heard about that already. John chapter nine, when Jesus opened the eyes of the man born blind. Remember, they brought in the blind man's parents, and the parents were unwilling to say much of anything at all about what happened. They said, "Yeah, he's our son, and he used to be blind, but beyond that, we don't know anything." 
And the reason they're saying that is because they're afraid to get kicked out of the synagogue, right? And then they bring in the blind guy again, and he finally just opens up and says, yeah, Jesus did this. I think he's the savior. And what happens to him? They kick him out of the synagogue. But then Jesus, the very next thing, comes and finds him, right? Because you get kicked out of the synagogue and Jesus is there to scoop you up right away. Um, he's not going to leave you out there on your own. So these religious leaders, they're afraid of the same thing happening to them, getting kicked out of the synagogue, which is the equivalent of getting kicked out of church, right? And yeah, they'd still be alive, but there's all this kind of public shame and humiliation that would come with getting kicked out of getting kicked out of the church. And it's not like you could just go to another one, right? It was all one unified thing. And everyone would know you got kicked out of that one. And if you got kicked out of that one, then you're kicked out of here too. You had no, you had no synagogue, no church anywhere, right? Um, so it, there's this public shame and humiliation that would have come along with it. And that's what John's talking about in verse 43. He says, for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God, right? They liked having their position of influence and power and being respected by others, right? Um, which I think we all we all like that. We all want to be respected by others. We don't want to be thought of as, you know, wrong or foolish or silly or stupid or anything like that, right? And that's how that's how these guys were going to be treated if they came out and said, "Yeah, I, I believe this Jesus guy," right? But um, one of these church fathers, this guy's uh, Saint John Chrysostom, he makes an interesting observation here. He says, "See how these men." were broken off from the faith through their love of honor, right? So they're broken off from the faith. They believe in their heart, but they won't confess with their mouth. And the scriptures tell us these two things go together, right? Paul later in the New Testament will say, you know, uh, if you believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and confess with your mouth that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And these two things go together. Believe in your heart, confess with your mouth. That's why every Sunday we confess our faith. One of the creeds, right? Believe in our heart, confess with our mouth. We believe it and we say it. Okay. Now these guys, there's a, there's a, it's broken off there. They have it in here, but they're unwilling to say it. And this is their problem. Okay. Then, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. All, all, that, that's true. That's so there, 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 there is that element of it too. But even, even just by coming to church on a Sunday morning, you're not verbally saying something, but you're saying something. Right. So even just by the fact that you're here on a Sunday, you're sending a message, right? That you believe this, right? And this is valuable and this is important to me, right? So, but but you're right. When we, we can point our fingers at these guys and say, oh, how could they be like that? But those times when we're afraid to say something because of what people might think about us, we're falling in the exact same trap as them, right? And so look how he says it here. They were not really rulers at all. They were rulers of the people of Israel in a technical kind of sense, but he says they're not really rulers of all at all, but they're slaves subject to the utmost slavery of human opinion, right? They're, they're, they're rulers in a technical kind of sense, but really they're slaves because they're afraid of what other people are going to think of them. They're, they're slaves to public opinion, right? And Jesus has come to set us free from that where we don't care about what people think or say or anything like that. We just care about what Jesus has done for us, right? And 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 trusting in him and confessing our faith and all that kind of stuff. Could, could it also be that they were um, afraid for their salvation? Getting kicked out of the synagogue because that would have been a question of their salvation too. Yeah, yeah. They would, yeah. Getting kicked out of the synagogue would for them would have been like, if, if, to use like maybe not the best analogy, but like in a, in a game of poker or something like that, where they have to push all of your chips into the middle of the table, right? You're all in now, right? You got nothing left. If you're wrong, you're really wrong, right? If you're right, you're really right. And they're and they don't want to do that. They want to be in both camps at the same time, right? Because they 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 do believe that Jesus is the Savior, that He's the Messiah, but they don't want to put push the chips all into the middle of the table yet because what if they're wrong and that's what they would be afraid of because once you get kicked out of the synagogue you're all in right he's either the messiah messiah the savior and you're right 
and you're saved through him, or you're wrong, he's not the Messiah, the Savior, and you're out of the synagogue, and you're not sure that you're saved anymore, because you're kicked out of the people of Israel, essentially. Yeah. It's still the, yeah. It doesn't make it, any, it doesn't justify it or make it any better, but it, from a worldly perspective, I think we can try, understand why they were struggling with that. Yeah. Any other thoughts or questions? Okay. Oh, Diana? Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Okay, so we we have to make a distinction between Jews back then and Jews today. They're not the same thing. Okay, they're in, in some cases they are kind of similar, but there's a bazillion kinds of different Jews today. Just like there's a bazillion different kinds of Christians today, there's denominations in Judaism. And so as soon yeah yeah, but as soon as you say he's a humanist, that tells us something, right? He doesn't actually believe a lot of the stuff that's in the Bible. Yeah, there. He's more of a, yeah, it's more of a philosophical kind of thing than a religious thing. And yeah, those guys probably don't believe in much spiritual stuff at all, right? I don't know much about him, that that individual specifically, but yeah 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 just like back then in in jesus's day there was different kinds of jews there was pharisees and sadducees for example pharisees believed in heaven sadducees did not right most of the jews would have considered themselves more along the lines of the pharisees they believed in those kind of things but some of them didn't the, the Sadducees didn't believe in angels. They didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. They said, once you're dead, you're dead. Pharisees believed in all that stuff, okay? Same thing today, uh, although it's a little bit different. You have Jews who actually believe the, the Torah, right? And are still looking for a Messiah. And you have Jews that are really just more cultural Jews. It's a cultural thing. Um, and it's more about our, our, our culture and our history and all that kind of stuff. Um, and they probably don't believe everything that's there in the old testament either so you got and and i'm not an expert on the different groups within judaism or anything like that it's just i just yeah you can't it's impossible to lump them all together because they're just so many it's so diverse right um but the i guess the common thread that ties all jewish people together um is that they don't believe that jesus was the savior right some of them don't even believe that there is a savior anymore it's all just, it was all just old stories, right? Some of them are looking for a savior still, right? Those are the, those are the old ones that you see walking around like Orthodox Jews with the curly hair things and all this, this other kind of stuff. They're the ones that still actually believe the stuff from way back when, at least some of them do. Anyways, it's, it's really complicated with Jews, <laughs> really complicated. Yeah, well, because you, you believe that, the, the 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 savior hasn't come yet. He, you believe that he wasn't the one. You're still looking for someone else. Yeah, yeah. In my theology, the Orthodox covered under reform. I noticed all three Jews and the reformers didn't remain in the Greek Latinos. The conservatives do certain things, certain things in the Old Testament. They didn't read up the Old Testament. They said it was totally irrelevant. The most religious group, the most yeah, 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 yeah. So you have these different different groups within within one religious belief system. Yeah, yeah. Right? They don't like Israel being set up as it is right now. They 
Yeah, yeah. All kinds of different, yeah, different ideas within that. Yeah, like us, like Christians, except even more diverse, right? Within Christianity, we have a set set of beliefs that if you don't accept this, you're not a Christian, right? We have like the Apostles' Creed. And like, if you don't believe that, you're not a Christian, right? Whereas within Judaism, it's much more, because it's a cultural thing too, you could be culturally a Jew and not believe any of it. Whereas we would say, well, if you don't believe any of it, you're not a Christian, right? Like it used aren't. Um, so that's where there's this there's this bigger diversity within them than there is within Christianity. Within Christianity, we are divided over certain really specific certain teachings, right? Um, where there is divided about everything, right? Whole worldview is different. Anyways. Okay, now let's read a little bit further. I want us to finish chapter 12 today. Uh, and so we're going to do that. Let's read uh, 44 down to verse 50, which is the rest of the chapter. As for the person who hears my words and does not hate them, I do not judge them. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save them. There is a house for one who rejects me and does not hate my words. That very word that sends forth will condemn him that lies in me. For I did not speak of my own accord, but the Father who sent me commanded me what to say and how to say it. And who has a man to the eternal life? For whatever I say to say, the Father has told me to say. All right. Thank you, Martin. Okay. So we, you look back to verse um, 36. Uh, we had said there, it says Jesus left and hid himself from them. Like he disappeared. All of a sudden, not quite yet, right? One more thing he's got to say to everybody, right? And this is the, this is the second time this has happened already. And Jesus is hiding himself from them. No, now he's got one more thing to say, but this is really the last one. Now this is in the gospel of John. This is Jesus's last public teaching. Last one right here. Um, and so he, and he kind of just cries out. He just kind of shouts this out to the crowds. Um, and, he, and what we have here in these two paragraphs in a lot of ways is a summary of everything that Jesus has been saying up till this point. There's very little here that's new. He's recapitulating is the word for what he's doing here. He's going back over it all again. So he's, he said all these things before. When a man believes in me, he, uh, he does not believe in me only but in the one who sent me, right? So he says, if you believe in me, you don't just believe in me, you believe in the father who sent me, right? And Jesus has been emphasizing this for ages, this oneness between him and the father, right? He's even, you said it that way. He said, I and the father are one, right? And he's emphasizing that here. So much so, he says in verse 45, when anyone looks at me, he sees the one who sent me. So if you want to see God, the father, look at me. This is going to come back later when Philip, one of the disciples, is going to ask Jesus, just show us the Father, he says. And Jesus says, don't you get it? If you see me, you've seen the Father, right? This is what you need to see. Um, uh, and so one of these church father guys, again, at St. John Chrysostom, he just really succinctly here, he says, this demonstrates, and he uses a big word, the consubstantiality. Um, that's what we say in the Nicene Creed, of one substance with the Father. And you can see substance in that word, consubstantiality. Con means together, right? Substance, one substance with the Father, consubstantiality. So Jesus and the Father are one. And Jesus is emphasizing that again. If you see me, you've seen the Father, one substance. Okay. Um, 
Verse 46, Jesus says, I've come into the world um, as light so that no one who believes in me should walk in darkness. We've heard Jesus say that even just a few verses ago. Um, and he said, I'm the light of the world. Whoever follows me walks not in darkness, but has the light of life. All these kind of things. I'm, I'm the light. So walk while you have the light. Jesus has said that a bunch of times. And then he goes on in verse 47. As for the person who hears my words, but doesn't keep them. And here keep them includes believing them right? Then a lot, and some of these people are those people, you know, there that are listening to him. They've heard what Jesus has said. They don't believe his words. As for those people, Jesus says, I do not judge them, okay? For I did not come to judge the world, but to save it. And this is John 3, 16, 17, and 18, and all that. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For the son didn't come into the world to judge the world, but to save the world, right? He will come again on the last day to judge the world. But Jesus says, I'm not here right now to judge you. I'm here to save you, right? And that's what he's saying here. So if you don't believe my words, um, I don't judge you right now. For I didn't come to judge the world but to save it. Then in verse 48, he says, there is a judge for the one who rejects me and does not accept my words. That very word which I spoke will condemn him at the last day. So Jesus says, look, if you don't believe my words, when I come again on the last day, you're going to see that everything that I said was true. And my words that I said are going to condemn you because you didn't believe. Right? So, um, this judgment idea doesn't sound very nice, but I, I, th this guy here, Cyril of Alexandria, gives us a helpful, helpful explanation of what Jesus is talking about here. So he says, those who refuse to hear Jesus and accept saving faith will condemn themselves. Jesus isn't condemning them. They're condemning themselves. For he who came to illumine, to, to give light, came not to judge, but to save. Therefore... He who dis disobeys and subjects himself to uh, and subjects himself to the greatest miseries can only blame himself as he is justly punished. Right? So he says, look, Jesus came into the world, preached his word to the world. And if a person has chosen not to believe in him, they're going to find out on the last day that they were wrong about all of that. And it's not that Jesus is condemning them. They're really condemning themselves by not believing what Jesus has plainly said to them, right? He doesn't come to judge the world. He comes to save the world. They're bringing judgment upon themselves by not listening to Jesus, okay? And then in verse 49, for I didn't speak of my own accord, but the father who sent me commanded me uh, what to say and how to say it. So again, he's emphasizing that oneness with the father. So if you, he says, if you hear me, you hear, if you believe in me, you believe in the father. If you see me, you see the Father. And really, he's saying here, if you listen to me, you're listening to the Father. Because the words that I'm speaking are given to me by the Father. There's no, there's no dissension in the Trinity. The words are one. From the Father, through the Son, the Holy Spirit speaking into our hearts. It's all, there's a oneness to it. Um, and then he says, I know that his command, God the Father's command, what God the Father is saying, it leads to eternal life. So if you don't want to deal with that judgment part of things, listen to the words that I'm saying, which God the Father is saying to you through me. So whatever I say is just what the Father has told me to say. And this is Jesus. And then, and Jesus's last public teaching. He's going to talk with his disciples in private after this, but no more teaching the big crowds, at least not in the Gospel of John. He's left it now. Okay, and he's kind of just put it out there. He says, either you believe what I said and you have eternal life or you don't believe what I said and you don't have eternal life. It's just that simple. And he just kind of leaves it at that. Thoughts or questions about any of that? How long was it before this crucifixion? Yeah, so this is this is Palm Sunday. So this is a few days. Yeah. Yeah. And actually, when we'll talk about this next time, but uh, between chapter 12 and chapter 13, we zoom from Palm Sunday to Maundy Thursday. 
right? We just go right through the, right through all of Holy Week to, to Thursday when Jesus is having supper in the upper room with his disciples, right? Um, the other gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they tell you about some of the stuff that happened on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. John doesn't give you any of that, straight to Thursday, right? Um, but then he spends a lot of time on Thursday. He uh, gives you a lot of stuff of what happened that Thursday that the other ones don't give us. Any other thoughts or questions? It was such an epic story. Such a deep understanding of the Holy Trinity. Yeah. Such a deep understanding of Christ is now salvation in him. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Such yeah. John and John theology. Yeah. We, there, there, there's an there's an unplumbable depth. Right. We can never get to the bottom of the Gospel of John. There'll always be more for us to unpack, to think about, to to be amazed by as we read through all this. And we're going to get one of the most amazing stories in the Gospel of John next week. I kind of wanted to get into chapter 13 today. If chapter 13 starts with Jesus washing his disciples' feet. And it's, it's a really familiar story, which means we take it for granted. We don't notice how amazing it really was, what Jesus did. And so next week, we're going we're gonna to just marvel at it a little bit, that Jesus would do that for his disciples. But well, we'll, we'll stop now because otherwise we'll rush through it. And I don't want to rush through it. So we'll leave it at that. For the yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 It times up kind of nicely. Yeah. Yeah. Any other thoughts or questions? Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's uh, let's pray. Lord Jesus, you are one with the Father, and you came into this world to speak uh, your word of life to us. Help us to hear your word and to delight in it and to believe it and to confess it, not afraid of what the world or other people might think of us as we uh, take your word to heart and let it shape and form our lives. But give us this confident hope and faith that clings to you in all things. We ask this all in your holy name. Amen. That's good.